Thank you, everyone. Welcome to the call today. Uh, my name is Caroline Leishman. I'm a former two-term city councillor in the city of Pell River, and I'm pleased to have taken on the role of Climate Leaders Program Manager with Community Energy Association, CEA, where I now have the opportunity to work with elected officials across BC. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to join us to hear from a great lineup of speakers on energy decarbonization and how we are collectively going to meet our Clean BC 2030 targets. We are recording the webinar, so it will be available for viewing later and sharing with any of your colleagues or anyone else who's interested in the topic. So CEA is the Community Energy Association and is comprised of more than 50 employees working across the province on climate action, resiliency, energy projects, and decarbonization of their communities. And one of the great programs CEA facilitates is the BC Municipal Climate Leadership Council, or BCMCLC. And we have the chair of the BCMCLC here, Rick Lochtenberg from the City of Nelson, who's just going to say a few words about the BC Municipal Climate Leadership Council. I'll turn it over to you for a sec, Rick. Thanks, Caroline. Hey, everybody. It's so great to see you all again. Um, the BC Municipal Climate Leadership Council is a network facilitated by the Community Energy Association with guidance from a steering committee composed of about a dozen elected officials from across BC. Now, BCMCLC brings together elected officials interested in accelerating the implementation of low carbon solutions. We're also supporting multiple community priorities. Network uh, meeting topics and content primarily focus on networking and information sharing and how we can bring these high impact projects in a community or region that are in a community region, um, how they can be adapted successfully in other communities. So our goal is to share and replicate outcomes, not effort. Now BCMCLC is supported by BC Hydro, um, the Real Estate Foundation of BC, uh, Van City, and the government of BC's Climate Action Secretariat. And one of the uh, exciting and, and really successful things that BCMCLC has been doing and has done in the past is convening not just our membership, but also higher orders of government and other interested parties to uh, accelerate climate action uh, outside even the scope of local government. So we had a successful UBCM um, luncheon with ministers that uh, it was really, I think, set a, a bar, a, a way of talking about climate uh, beyond partisanship. So uh, there's many exciting things. We do want to build on on that uh, part of things too. So that's BCMCLC. I'll back to Caroline. Thanks so much, Rick. And we do have an exciting webinar today on energy decarbonization and meeting our clean BC targets. Uh, but first, we do want to make our commitment to truth and reconciliation uh, known. Uh, the Community Energy Association commits fully to the principles of truth and reconciliation. Um, as an organization, we are operationalizing uh, the principles of, of the UN Declaration of the Rights of, of Indigenous Peoples. Through all the work we do to help communities reduce greenhouse gas emissions, conserve energy, and support community energy resilience, CEA acknowledges that Indigenous peoples have suffered under colonization and that the intergenerational trauma of unjust colonial policies and practices continues to impact Indigenous peoples and communities. We, we are working really hard on bringing all this into our everyday operations and working together to find shared values and, and really uh, lift up Indigenous communities. We, I reside in the Cathet Regional District, which is within the ancestral and stolen lands of the Tuolumne peoples who have lived sustainably in this territory for at least 10,000 years. And um, we thought we would have, we uh, created a Mentimeter little exercise for the attendees today um, to post about something about your your community, your um, your indigenous neighbors, some kind of story or a thing that you're you're excited about or proud of in your region. Um, our the Tuolumne people of my region have just recently assigned a, a memorandum of, of understanding with the province on uh, 
getting back their land, their original village site of, of T-Squat within our region, which is where our hydroelectric facility actually exists. And the mill was built a uh, hundred and so years ago. So it's a big piece and uh, it's a good step uh, in the right direction with the province working towards getting the, the lands back to the Tuaman people. So we thought we would post this Mentimeter and if attendees are able to, you can use the QR code or type that code into the Mentimeter and post, um, I believe the question is just around something that um, your, your community's relationship with your Indigenous neighbours, uh, some kind of collaborative project or event or something learning, uh, something you've learned about your Indigenous neighbours. If you want to post that in there, that would be really great. So we'll just take a moment to do that while people are doing that. And then we're going to get ready for our first presenters from BC Hydro. Great. There's some great great um, things coming into there. So you can carry on doing that if you uh, aren't quite done. Uh, in the meantime, I'm going to introduce our first presenters. Uh, so we are very excited and grateful to have BC Hydro presenting today on our electrified future, BC Hydro's plan to support climate action. And we have both Robin Work, Manager of Market Transformation, and Robin Webb, Manager of Local Government Conservation and Climate Action here today. So I'm going to turn it over to Robin Work first uh, to start the presentation. Thank you so much. Hey, thanks very much um, for inviting us to come along and speak today um, at BCMCLC. Uh, we've been a long-term supporter of um, the leadership that you're showing within local governments. Uh, both me and the other Robin, uh, you have worked within local governments uh, as part of our career. And uh, you know, speaking personally, um, you know, I've sat on many committees as a staff person and just have enormous respect uh, for elected officials and the time that you put in um, to be able to represent your communities. Uh, it's it's, a, it's an extraordinary thing to do. And uh, I really appreciate uh, you know, the, the time you're spending um, and, and similarly um, your, the opportunity here to come and talk to you about what we are doing as BC Hydro uh, around the electrified future. Oops. Okay, so can you see the second slide? Is that good? Yes. Excellent. All right. So um, yeah, here, I'll start off by just giving a bit of a snapshot of our of our system as it stands uh, here in BC today. So BC Hydro is a, a crown corporation, publicly owned, uh, and we're regulated by the BC UC, uh, the British Columbia Utilities Commission. We serve about 5 million customers, and that represents about 95% of the province's population. So throughout BC, except for a small portion within the Okanagan, we have about 30 hydroelectric plants, and we'll be adding another one um, in 2025, that's Site C, up in the Port Peace River. So here's a, a bit of an image of all of our facilities or, or, or our main facilities. You'll see of our large generating stations uh, up here in the Columbia um, and sorry, up here in the Peace and down there in the Columbia. Um, so we're, we're about 70% is large hydro. Uh, we have about 20% um, is run of river hydro, we have some biomass, a small amount of wind and a tiny amount of solar at this time. And we're very, very fortunate. As I meet with other utilities across North America and internationally, uh, what we have here in BC is really, really, uh, I was gonna say unique, but I guess we have it in Manitoba uh, and Quebec as well. This idea that we have uh, close to 100% uh, carbon free electricity. So a lot of utilities, you know, you'll, you'll you know, think of, California and them talking about all the solar work that they're doing and or Texas and the wind that they're doing, etc. Uh, but a lot of utilities are just fighting to decarbonize their overall electricity uh, within their system. We're very fortunate uh, that we're pretty much there. We're 98% uh, clean electricity at this time. When we think about uh, what's the overall energy use within BC, uh, that what's fueling our transportation, our industry, our homes, 
our, our buildings, commerce, etc. cetera. Um, electricity is currently just a small portion of that. It's 19%. Uh, most of that, uh, most of our communities, uh, industry is being uh, fueled by fossil fuels, whether that's natural gas, uh, petroleum, propane, etc. There's some biomass in there as well. And really the, the challenge for us as a province is to get off fossil fuels. Um, and obviously a very important route to that is electrification. It's been identified in international, like uh, in the, by the UN, um, by the, the national government, by the provincial government, by local governments. It's very, very clear that electrification is a lead solution to, cl the, cl to the climate crisis. And so we've been given direction by the province um, how can we use clean electricity? How can we generate new clean electricity in order to switch the province off fossil fuels? So our first electrification plan was in 2021, um, five year plan, uh, looking at allocating 190 million to promote electrification. Uh, that included incentives, studies, programs, et cetera. Uh, and it focused on uh, programs to be able to accelerate electricity electrification in industry, transportation, and buildings. So I'll just talk about electrification in transportation and buildings, as I know uh, that's pr probably your focus uh, as local government elected officials. So certainly transportation is a very significant part uh, of the carbon pie here in BC. And so our, our plan uh, looks at what, you know, what does future projections of uh, transportation electrification look like? And then how can we support that as a utility? So here's some of the forecasts that we are seeing. Um, really a very significant ramp up driven by the ZEV mandate, uh, which is requiring uh, new car purchases uh, to be uh, electric uh, going through to 2030, 2035. So there's a very significant ramp up uh, of passenger electric vehicles, um, and we need to be able to respond to that as, as BC Hydro. So in 2022, uh, there was about 82,000 uh, registered uh, uh, zero emissions vehicles, and that could grow to about 900,000 uh, by 2033. So a really big ramp up. And it's not just passenger vehicles. We're also working with our partners in uh, TransLink um, and transit authorities uh, in industry um, and with you know, commercial uh, uh, vehicles and, and shipping as well. And we're seeing electrification of all those fleets as well. So a very significant load uh, within communities and within the province. The second uh, thing I'm gonna talk about is buildings and building electrification. And as we think about market transformation, I'm thinking about buildings as basically being where vehicles were about five years ago. So we have significant, uh, well, we have significant building electrification throughout the province already, uh, often using baseboards, um, but we really would love to see efficient electrification of buildings. So really looking at heat pumps. And we already have pretty good market penetration in some parts of the province, like on Vancouver Island, um, but other parts of the province in the lower mainland um, and, and elsewhere, especially up in the north and the winter cities, uh, we see buildings uh, with their, with their um, heating and hot water systems often being fueled by fossil fuels. So when we're talking about fuel switching from natural gas to electricity, uh, it's really the space heating and the, and the hot water that is the significant uh, things that we need to be targeting um, as they you know, really accommodate a lot of the, 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 the natural gas use within those buildings. And we are seeing that it's entirely possible to have all electric buildings. So here's some examples of some recent all electric single family homes. Um, so all electric multifamily residential homes. This one's up in Pemberton, so in a colder climate. And then also in commercial and institutional buildings. So we have these are some new uh, hospitals that are being designed, uh, or actually a retrofit on the Cowagen one, and then in a new Surrey Hospital and Cancer Centre, and some really interesting projects uh, with uh, the healthcare industry, looking at things like how can we use uh, batteries or large scale batteries within those facilities to be able to be used for emergency generation, uh, emergency 
um, generation uh, for the hospitals and then us be able to use that from a load sharing perspective. So some lots of really interesting opportunities um, at how we uh, address uh, both resiliency, climate resiliency, building resiliency, and also grid resiliency as well. So these are some of the things that are happening uh, that we're seeing happen in the province and we see really uh, you know, big transitions that are happening. But there's two big questions that we're getting asked as BC Hydro. First of all is when will we need more electricity and what are you doing about it, Hydro? And the second one is how do we keep the grid strong and reliable? And I'm gonna turn over to uh, Robin and she can talk us through uh, the answers to some of these questions. And Robin, so I'm much. controlling the slides, so feel free to, to let me know when, not, when to change. Okay, that's great, thanks so much. Yeah, and again, thanks uh, very much for having me today as well. I've been with BC Hydro for uh, just over a year. And as Robin mentioned, prior to that, I worked um, on climate action programs for about 15 years. A lot of that at the municipal level, so for the city of Victoria and the city of Edmonton. And I'm really excited that my role at Hydro is uh, working very closely with local governments and helping you guys to advance your climate plans. And so that's why um, Robin and I and our team sat down and made these presentations because we were receiving these questions from our local government partners. So I'll give you a little bit more insight into uh, what we're doing to increase energy supply, but also what we're doing to help with the grid. So if we move on to the next slide. So in our current state today, um, BC Hydro actually has a, a surplus of electricity. And in 2025, um, the Site C dam is also anticipated to come online, which would add an additional about 8% to the supply that we have today. However, our long-term planning process uh, really shows us that towards the end of the decade, even Site C is not going to be enough and we're going to need more electricity. So if we move on to the next slide. So you may have heard recently that Hydro has actually put out a call for power or call for new renewable electricity. So in our um, call for power that's upcoming in next spring, we're seeking proposals for really large scale utility projects. We're anticipating that um, solar and wind will be some of the most cost-effective um, proposals that we'll receive. But we also have a number of other factors that we're looking at when choosing projects. So if we move on to the next slide. And we, we wanted to just um, be clear because a lot of our local government partners have had a lot of questions about the, the call for power. We are looking for really large projects. So projects that are in um, the scale of their, um, they're working on the minimum threshold right now, but to date they're saying about 30 to 50 megawatts and the maximum would be about 200 megawatts. So I think um, for context, about 100 megawatts of power is enough to power, um, or sorry, 100 megawatts of solar power specifically is enough to power about 15,000 to 20,000 homes for a day, just if that gives you a sense of sort of the magnitude of some of the projects that we're looking at. But some of the other things that we're also considering for this upcoming call for power is the ability to connect these projects into our existing transmission system, very specifically about cost effectiveness, but also um, we're committed to partnerships with uh, local First Nations throughout the province to be part of the ownership structure of a lot of these big projects. So moving on to the next slide. But we also wanna note that um, before we as Hydro go out to look for any sort of new energy supply, we're really committed to doing everything possible to actually reduce energy demand in the first place. And so you're probably well aware of a lot of our um, long-term power smart programs that have provided incentives to residents for things like insulation. Without some of those programs in the market, we anticipate that um, our overall energy use in BC would be about 10% higher than it is today because of those historical investments through these programs. 
And so moving forward, we plan to invest in these energy efficiency programs even more than we have in the past. So if we move on to the next slide. Um, we wanted to provide some assurance. There's been a lot of interest from local governments in our long-term planning process. So our roadmap for de um, delivering this electrified future is through our integrated resource plan. I often make the uh, association that this is sort of similar to Hydro's OCP. So this is our, our long-term plan and strategy. And we recently um, updated our integrated resource plan and filed it with the BCUC so that um, we have aligned all of our long-term goals to ensure that we're going to meet the goals associated with the government of BC's Clean BC plan. But we're also accelerating um, the timeline in which we do these integrated resource plans, noting that so much is changing with electrification as a climate solution. So we're committed to um, undertaking um, the, that planning process in a condensed um, timeline from what we have done in the past. We've also, um, the government of BC also just struck a new task force that's been working with Hydro to really ensure that we are well positioned to electrify BC's economy moving forward. So we move on to the next slide. So now on to that second question, that's more about the grid. If we move on to the next one. Um, in BC, we have both a transmission and a distribution grid. And you know both of these are equally important in terms of getting power to you. But we wanted to note that um, today we have a massive expansion of our grid underway. It's actually one of the largest expansions and investments that's actually happened in the province's history. We move on to the next slide. And a lot of that work um, is happening to the distribution grid. So that's really the grid that's closer to our customers. That's the one that's in your communities. And so we're putting a lot of investment into this grid to strengthen our infrastructure and to ensure that, you know, when everyone switches everything on at once, the grid is able to, to handle that. And this actually requires working quite closely with local governments, and so we are in contact with their staff quite a bit. But I did want to note that we have been experiencing challenges um, in getting some of our infrastructure built within local government boundaries. And I think Hydro, just like local governments, you know, we're really concerned about not wanting to hold up timelines for new housing, and we understand the pressure that a lot of municipalities are under to deliver on that as well, too. So. We are currently working on a couple of pilots with a few of our municipal partners to see how we could um, speed up some of that process of infrastructure delivery so that we have our infrastructure in place in order to service electrification in your areas. So we move on to the next slide. We're also doing um, quite a bit of work around strengthening the grid uh, to um, ensure that we have resiliency for climate change. The The nature of um, electrical grids are that they are built with a lot of redundancy in the first place, but nonetheless, um, you know, the increased severity of climate events has really um, meant that we need to have a focus on working on how we can sort of prevent, detect, and manage and respond to climate change. And so we're doing that by advancing our climate adaptation plan and we also have a team that's looking specifically at how we can support communities core infrastructure in the event that you have a severe climate event like a flood or a fire and you know that was really challenged this summer we had a, a number of communities that were without power for days so I, again i think hydro sees the importance of doing that work moving forward so next slide um, so there are a number of things that we've also been doing to help prepare for electrification and to remove some of the barriers that we're hearing from some of our key stakeholders. You may have heard from the development community in your local government you know, that it might cost too much or take too long to connect to, to the electrical grid. So there are a number of initiatives that we have underway 
to help rectify some of those challenges. And one of those is around our distribution extension policy. So this policy actually outlines the way um, in which new customers connect to our grid and sets up the fee structures that is paid to connect to the grid. So we are currently reviewing that policy and taking an update to um, the BCUC next June that's looking at um, creating more equitable costs for these connections. But also um, another challenge that we've heard from the development community is just there's a lot of unpredictability about what that cost would look like. So creating a more unitized fee and a more known fee structure for developers that are connecting to the grid. So the next slide. Um, Another thing that we're actively working on right now is around connection timelines. So this is again, like similar to your permitting process, you know, this is uh, something that we are also looking to accelerate at Hydro as well too. And we're really looking to condense the timelines for applications. That being said, we really have been receiving many more complex applications that, than what was received in the past. So we're looking at efficiencies and different systems that we can use to speed up some of the design work that's needed um, to approve these applications, but we've also done a major amount of hiring just to have more frontline staff that are actually working on approving these applications as well. Next slide. Um, so just in, in finishing up, Robin and I also wanted to note, um, you know, our role at Hydro, again, working specifically with local governments, we're really trying to provide a lot of support for you and for your furthering of your climate action programs. So we do a lot of this in conjunction with uh, Community Energy Association, who's been a really great partner in um, setting up these local government staff peer networks. And so we hope that um, most of the staff in your communities participate in these networks, but if not, uh, CA would be happy to provide follow-up information. So some of these networks are topical based, like the step code peer network or the electric vehicle peer network, but um, others are more geographically based with ones like the Vancouver Run, I'm just getting off the ground. So, um, Hydro has been the sole funder of a number of these networks for years, and we're really excited that um, the province and others are now coming online. And just um, from a personal perspective, I worked on climate for the city of Edmonton for years. And when I moved to BC and started working in Victoria, these networks were such a wealth of information that it really helps just to accelerate the pace of change by people sharing information, sharing council reports, all their feasibility studies. So again, um, highly encourage uh, everyone to get their staff involved in them if they're not already. It's a, a great way to um, have information from some of the bigger communities cascade down into the smaller communities. If we uh, go to the next slide. Um, one of, because another thing that we are able to provide for some of the larger communities is we actually do co-fund positions in climate action teams in the 17 biggest communities in BC. And so this photo is some of the people who are part of that, that network. And again, um, we really use this network of sort of the leaders and the co-funded positions to do some of that leading work and then cascade it down through um, the peer networks into various communities in BC. Um, move to the next slide. So just in closing, um, it's been a really interesting time to work at BC Hydro with um, someone who has a municipal background and focus because we as an organization really have decided that our relationship with municipalities is going to be one of our primary focus areas in moving our electrification mandate forward. And so we're really looking at different um, models of how we can strengthen our partnership with local governments and to do things like really gain a better understanding of some of your future goals, your climate and land use plans, but also to identify some of those areas for collaboration and, and future problem solving. And again, to really get that electrical infrastructure in the ground so that we can start uh, electrifying everything. 
And uh, I just want to know, I, I have to leave a little bit early at about 1.15 today because I'm actually going to a workshop with uh, a local government where we're working through some of these approaches today too. So we're actively in that solution space as we speak. And so that's uh, that's it for me. And I think we'll pass it back to our moderators to tee up the next speakers. That's fantastic. Thank you so much um, to both of you. And we, yeah, we are going to come back to uh, questions a little bit later. So uh, hopefully one of the Robins will still be on by then, but um, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Lisa Mack uh, from Community Energy Association, who is the climate a climate solutions specialist. So she's gonna talk a little bit about uh, what how, how local governments can be supported. Go ahead, Lisa. Thanks so much, Caroline, and uh, thank you, Robins. This really tees up my very brief presentation very well. Um, so as Caroline has mentioned, I am a climate solutions specialist with CEA. Um, we are a BC-based nonprofit working exclusively at the community level to support local climate action. Um, so why the local level? It's because um, the impacts of climate change are most felt at the local level. And so it is at the local level where we have most direct in influence in climate action. So while the federal government is responsible for coordinating overarching environmental policies and programs and setting national standards, and the provincial government sets targets and regulations such as Clean VC and Step Code, the local government is actually where the action happens. Um, local government support of the on the ground implementation of actually getting to those targets play a big role in and they also play a big role in shaping our communities, literally. Local governments have jurisdiction over zoning and land use, so informing where and how our buildings are built. And as buildings account for one of the biggest portions of community emissions, local governments have a major role and responsibility to support the, de the decarbonization of buildings. To rapidly reduce emissions from our communities, local governments focus their efforts on actions where there will be the greatest impacts, um, sometimes known as the big moves. I'm sure some of you are familiar with this graphic. Um, these are centered around transportation, buildings, and waste. And as those are the biggest sources of community emissions, those are also the biggest opportunities for reductions. And as Hydro has mentioned, um, CA does support various peer networks around topics that align with these initiatives. Um, including one for new construction. Um, the step code peer network has been around since the inception of the energy step code, so since 2017. Um, and it's just been a really great space for local government staff to come together, learn together, um, hear from experts, share successes and challenges, and just really be able to um, move that dial together faster. And since um, the release of the zero carbon step code on May 1st. There's been a lot of interest from our members to learn more about um, what zero carbon step code is and how to adopt and implement it faster. And so we actually created a subgroup within the peer network. And in the past six months, we've been able to support 12 communities to adopt it. Uh, most of it have gone straight to emissions level three or four, so the top levels of um, the zero carbon step code. And many have also adopted a two tiered path pathway um, just to allow for some more flexibility and options for the builders and homeowners in their communities. Um, many of the reasons why our members have indicated that they're so interested in step code or zero carbon step code, sorry, is because it provides quantifiable metrics for tracking progress towards emissions reductions. So really being able to see how the, um, your community is working towards emissions reductions in line with um, your own card targets and community plans. Um, just learnings from how the energy step code was brought online. We've also learned that early adoption really helps and being able to set those targets early and communicating them out really helps set industry up for success. Having those timelines um, signals to industry what is coming and it allows them to prepare um, adequately and effectively. And also having a space to be able to connect with neighboring communities and um, across BC allows for aligning adoption pathways um, to provide consistency for industry, especially because builders often work across municipal boundaries. So having consistent requirements really helps um, strengthen the capacity of industry to be able to build to levels that it's required. 
Um, so in summary, yeah, just tell your staff to join a peer network. Um, there's lots of support and resources available. There's a lot of information out there and we're happy to help um, clarify some of that. Um, and as well as to help coordinate some of the industry capacity building and engagement. Again, setting those targets early helps signal the direction that your community is moving and it helps allow your industry base to adapt and prepare. And collaboration is key, whether that's with neighboring communities, with utilities, with industry organizations. Um, the more people who can be in the conversation and like brought on together, like the faster we can all move together. And that's it. Back to you, Caroline. That's fantastic, Lisa. Thank you so much. Um, that's a wealth of information. <laughs> Um, okay, so next we're going to turn it over to Jessica McElroy, who is the manager of the Pemben Institute's Buildings Program. Jessica is also a city councillor uh, with the City of North Vancouver, works with Climate Caucus, and is also one of our steering committee members on the BC Municipal Climate Leadership Council. So Jessica wears multiple hats, and Jessica is going to talk today about the um, role of renewable natural gas in the zero carbon step code. So I'll turn it over to Jessica. Working on, working on sharing my screen. Let's see. Perfect. Yeah, we see it. Are we starting from the beginning? Yep. Okay. Excellent. Uh, yes. Thank you, Carol Ann. Um, and thank you to the Robins and, and Lisa for your remarks as well. Um, obviously, a lot of familiar faces in the uh, the group today, but I am here wearing a, a different hat. And so for the past year, I have uh, worked with the Pembina Institute. I'm just making sure my slides will advance, but if I want them to, um, as part of their buildings program. There we go. Um, so just to, wanted to uh, leave this slide in that acknowledges the, the lands on which the Pembina Institute's head office in what is now known as Calgary um, are on, and but acknowledge also that I am located and work and play and live on the ancestral territories of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations, and I respectfully acknowledge the presence of many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people on these lands. For those of you that don't know the Pembina Institute, it is a clean energy think tank that has been around for close to 40 years. The mission is to advance a prosperous clean energy future for Canada through credible policy solutions that support communities, the economy, and a safe climate. So I was asked to join today specifically to speak to a report that we released in June uh, called the role of renewable natural gas and the zero carbon step code. And it was a report that tried to provide some information and assistance for local government decision making as the zero carbon step code was pulled out. Uh, so the sort of key message and, and piece that um, the, the report speaks to that I wanted to highlight is that through electrification, fuel switching and energy efficiency actions, British Columbians can reduce energy demand and cost while living in better homes that help conserve our limited renewable and low carbon fuels for hard to decarbonize sectors. So we're gonna dig into that a little bit more and see what that means. And we wanted to start with some explanation on what renewable natural gas is and isn't. You know, there, there are a number of different renewable and low carbon fuels that we speak to and that are referenced in our energy future, but renewable natural gas is a biomethane um, gas that is captured from bio waste, so agricultural waste or organic waste, uh, and it is as a molecule interchangeable with natural gas. So it's able to be injected into the existing natural gas infrastructure system. Um, it is not hydrogen and it is not biomass. Then we wanted to look at the cost of heating with renewable natural gas compared to electricity. So um, you know, if we continue to to look um, at building out renewable natural gas or natural gas infrastructure systems for, for new buildings, what would that really mean? Um, and we found that, you know, as, as we build new homes, we know that there's going to be an increasing demand for energy. You know, that's a given. 
What we're also seeing is that there's increasing incentives uh, and supports and financial tools from all levels of government and utilities that are really supporting the move to electrification, and supporting heat pumps in particular, but also a lot of support and incentives for those you know, demand side management or energy efficiency actions as well. And in that increasing of the amount and number of homes that are shifting to electricity, what's going to result is there's going to be a decreasing amount of customers left on the gas ne network. And so there's going to be a shift in how that gas network needs to cover its costs. And the, you know, what the projection is, is then that the, the cost per customer is going to rise as we need to ensure that that gas network is maintained. We also know that there's going to be a limited supply of RNG. We, we don't have a significant resource available to us. And so what is that going to mean for, for future costs? And it's actually quite risky. So then we wanted to look at could BC's RNG production capacity. So what we what we believe there is out there could actually meet our future energy demands as well as our climate targets. So being able to meet our emissions reductions targets and climate adaptation targets, as well as meeting that future energy need. What we know is that there's a huge variety in projections of what the supply could be. You know, we don't have a very clear picture of, of what it could be because it depends a lot on what that fuel source is and where it's coming from, whether or not we're you know, capturing a significant amount and, and increasing amount of organic waste, or whether we're starting to actually use some biofuel sources and, and biomass sources in a different way um, and using woodstock and, and forestry materials. We really don't know what the, um, the future might hold in that space, but looking at a national level, if we used all of the different sources that we could for renewable natural gas, it would only amount to about 3.3% of our current natural gas consumption. So we know that we can't replace natural gas entirely with, with renewable natural gas um, or really in any sort of meaningful way. So our supply just really isn't there. Then we looked at the, you know, are we gonna meet our climate goals? using renewable natural gas and specifically if we started to look at using it in homes and new homes for space and water heating you know and is is it truly low carbon and will it be low carbon into the future again there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of risk associated with relying on renewable natural gas in this way so we've talked about how the supply really isn't there domestically. We don't have the sources to produce enough renewable natural gas in BC to meet the natural gas demand and, and offset that, that demand. So what the plan actually is, is to buy environmental attributes from other jurisdictions. So it's a process of buying renewable natural gas from somewhere else, another province or state, but you're not actually physically buying that gas you're just purchasing a credit and it's purchasing an environmental attribute that's associated with that gas. So again, it's a risky long-term solution. We know that all of the jurisdictions in, in North America really are starting to make very significant climate um, action targets and are gonna need all of the, their own domestic supplies um, and emissions reductions opportunities in their own jurisdictions. So having long-term secure contracts for sources of greenhouse gas emissions reductions from another jurisdiction, um, really there's no guarantee that we're gonna have that for a long period of time. And because renewable natural gas is a similar molecule that can be put into our natural gas system, you know, there's really no guarantee that the continued future supply of RNG that you have coming to your home is gonna stay renewable natural gas. Because if those contracts end, um, and in, this, in the future, with supply situations start to change, that renewable natural gas can actually just be switched back to natural gas. So again, we're finding that you know, relying on renewable natural gas as a secure source of space and water heating and a low carbon source um, has a really high association of risk to it. So then, you know, the, the idea of looking at decarbonizing our entire, um, you know, province in, in all sectors and in all industry and looking back at what Robin showed about how, you know, still about 70% of our energy demand is being met by fossil fuels. 
you know, we're we're at a point where it's really it's all hands on deck to do everything we can, you know, to to decarbonize, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, to electrify everything that can be electrified. And there's a lot of things that can be electrified really quickly and easily because we have that technology now available to us. You know, we have heat pumps that are available and ready to go. We can decrease the demand uh, for energy through energy efficiency measures. And we have a lot of things that we can implement right now. At the same time, we're trying to find some solutions for things that are harder to decarbonize, or maybe where electrification isn't our easy short-term supply or, or opportunity. So we do have you know, the opportunity to use renewable fuels, both hydrogen and, and biomass, but also RNG in those places where we really need it most. So industrial processes, heavy duty transportation, uh, and potentially backing up heating in places where it's either a cooler temperature average in the winter, or we don't have currently have an electricity supply that's available and, and ready when we need it. So we, you know, we we do recognize that renewable natural gas and other low carbon fuels are going to have a role to play in BC's energy future, but we need to be strategic and thoughtful about where we actually use those. And then I just wanted to mention a couple other pieces of, of work that Pembina um, has done to support the zero carbon step code and, and advancement in the province and with local government. So in September, we put together an industry sign on letter that had more than 30 signatures from builders, architects, equipment suppliers, and other sector members that did clearly say that they are ready and willing to work towards the zero carbon step code emissions levels and tiers. Uh, they, they have the expertise, they have um, the, the supply chain access and are also working towards trying to build net zero homes um, as fast as they can. And so we've sent that letter out to councillors um, and mayors across the province and have also sent targeted letters of support to local governments who need it with some backup information on what the role of renewable and natural gas could be, but also the benefit um, and importance of adopting the zero carbon step code and using it in tandem with the energy step code as a tool to really make sure that all of our homes are climate resilient, you know, being able to adapt to climate impacts that we're experiencing already, as well as you know, climate mitigation tools and, and reducing our carbon emissions. We've also worked with Help Cities Lead, which is initiative through Climate Caucus and has partnerships with uh, staff from some municipalities and Pembina uh, is, is a participant there. And Health Cities Lead has some information on its website also around uh, the renewable natural gas future and zero carbon step code. And I can put a link in the chat to, uh, to that material as well. I'm happy to provide links to both the industry sign-on letter that we have put together and the report that we put together as well. So that is all I had for, for the presentation, a brief sort of look at what we did with our uh, renewable natural gas report. I'm happy to answer any questions. I'm not necessarily an expert on building code, but I know that there's some great people online that can help uh, answer those questions as well. Thank you. That's fantastic, Jessica. Thank you so much. And yeah, if you wouldn't mind posting uh, links in the chat to the, the things you mentioned and your contact information, that would be great. But we are going to move into Q&A and discussion. So um, we do have a couple of questions I see have um, been posted in the Q&A and you can post in the chat as well if you have questions or comments. Uh, I just also want to um, acknowledge that we do have someone from the Climate Action Secretariat on the call. If there are any any questions around the sort of the economic, um, economic implications of Clean BC from that side of it, from the province. So, um, if anything, if anybody has any questions around anything around implementation of Clean BC, we can we can probably direct that. So um, we do have a couple. So Rick, um, our chair of BC MCLC, is going to navigate uh, the Q and A a bit. So Rick, do you want to take over? And um, there's a couple questions in the Q and A. Cool. Thanks, Caroline. So we've got from John. John. Um, I think what we'll do, since we don't have a lot yet, but I'm sure we'll get more as we go along. That's always the way it works. I'll let you um, ask your question because there might be a little bit of follow-up in there, but I may take over depending on uh, if we start flooding in with questions. So go ahead, John. 
Okay, I'll start with the first one. And um, it seems like we do have to create a lot more re, um, clean energy to meet our needs in the future. One thing I didn't see uh, mentioned was geothermal as a source of uh, potential um, significant amounts of power in the in our future. Can you speak to that? Sure, H happy to do that. So um, where the call for power is, we'll be calling out to um, prospective uh, businesses uh, to produce uh, bids uh, for generating electricity in BC. So it'll be interesting to see what we come what, what comes through, John. Um, when we, we do have resource assessments about what uh, opportunities are for clean electricity uh, in the province, um, and there's a lot, um, but from a cost effective perspective, uh, we believe that what we're likely to be seeing will be uh, wind, and solar as, as more cost effective than geothermal. But uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what comes through. Thank you. Robin, I wanna follow up on that because I think wind and solar, one of the common perceptions of those intermittent sources is it's intermittent. Um, and so it suggests that we need um, ways to you know, balance that intermittency to create a more stable source. So I'm interested in both the advanced metering infrastructure that might be a part of it, uh, and then the things like battery storage and stuff like that. And can you comment on BC Hydro's plans for that kind of thing? Yeah, for sure. Um, well, first of all, I'll say, we, I mean, we're in an incredible situation here in BC compared with other jurisdictions because we have these major batteries and that's our dams. Um, so we've been operating them. You know, we have the capacity to be able to turn them on or turn them off as, as, as demand comes through. Um, and that's that's very different from um, I, other jurisdictions where you've got, say, a, a coal or a gas plant that you turn it on and it just keeps churning night or day, whether you, you know, it's very going to be very expensive to be able to turn it down and then turn it up. So generally they just sort of churn. And then similarly, then you've got your renewables coming in like wind or solar, which are intermittent. So uh, that issue of, uh, of, of, of load balance is a is a issue for you know utilities throughout the world. We're super lucky because we have those large dams which can basically add as batteries. So it's a it's an awesome core uh, for our sort of renewable future of bringing in solar um, and wind. So that's my first point. Uh, my second point is though, nonetheless, we need to be thinking about the the peaks. You know when that peak demand is. Um, and for us in BC, uh, it's typically, you know, the, 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 the biggest peak we get is those cold winter nights when everybody comes home uh, from, from work and, you know, turns on uh, the lights and the cooking and the heating, etc. So there's real, real, there's real peaks during those times. Um, and so as much as we can do to be able to balance those peaks is going to be uh, helpful for our, for our grid. So we, we have no problem, I think, balancing it from a load perspective because we've got those big batteries. But it's really important that we balance it from a grid perspective so that we don't have to build these uh, you know, super um, big infrastructure to be able to deal with the peaks in my home and your home and the you know, business down the road, et cetera. Uh, so that's where the opportunity to... Uh, be able to use um, uh, tools to be able to, um, where you've got, you know, where you plug in your your vehicle, your electric vehicle. Like, ideally, that's not coming on as a demand uh, at that same time on that November evening at, at five o'clock. But instead, uh, it'll be awesome for that to instead be charging, uh, you know, three in the morning where that demand has gone down. So how do we um, make sure that those sort of, uh, that we balance that load on a building level. And that's where there's opportunities for rates, there's opportunities for metering, uh, there's opp opportunities for like apps on your on your smartphone to be able to program it in. Yeah, when I plug in, I want it to be, uh, you know, just charging at a certain time, et cetera. And for us as BC Hydro to be putting uh, signals in. So that's that's some of the, you know, what we might see uh, at a building level to be able to reduce that, that peak load. Um, but we're still going to have peak loads that are happening within communities. And uh, so there is going to be a role for batteries. Um, and uh, we have a large deployment of batteries put into our, our long term plan, uh, particularly in, in our load centers, like in the lower mainland, uh, Vancouver Island, etc. So it'll be really interesting as we think about uh, what the role of batteries will be going forward, 
you know, everything from, you know, as we'll see, you know, batteries in my in my e-bike, uh, batteries that obviously on our, our computer that we're talking about, uh, but also batteries that are being used to be able to um, deal with those peaks. Um, so yeah, that there's a there's a big future for batteries uh, in BC and, and internationally. And another, I was just, just to follow up, um, I put two yeah. links in the chat there as well to two. Uh, consumer facing programs that we have one's called uh, peak rewards and the other one's called peak savers and the peak rewards one is really utilizing some of that technology Robin was talking about too that will allow us as a utility to go and turn down your hot water tank a degree during some of those peaks too so again we don't have to keep on building our infrastructure up to the peak. So um, these two programs are both voluntary, but members of the public can sign up for them right mm -hmm. now. So we're also really trying to get the word out about um, that the, yeah, the future of the grid is going to look very different than the present too, with a lot of these connected technologies where at some point, you know, all of the different pieces of equipment in your home are going to be equipped with these sorts of sensors and Wi-Fi enabled equipment that will allow um, utilities to do some of this work should you choose to be part of the, the programs. Well, um, Robin, to build on that, Robin Webb, um, you were saying in your presentation uh, that you were looking for local government support on on distribution, you know, getting some of that, uh, those distribution upgrades. Can you speak to what you actually hope for from local governments to support your work there? Yeah, yeah, I can definitely speak more more to that. I think um, one of the major challenges for us as a utility that services the entirety of the province is, you know, we work with 180 plus municipalities and the process for getting sign off for things like a substation or a distribution feeder can be different in all of those communities. And so in some places, it's very streamlined and very easy. And in others, um, we're facing sort of increasing amounts of requirements that didn't used to exist in the past, too. And, you know, hydro as a utility, we're really, we have a mandate to keep our, our rates low, too. And I guess some of those uh, additional requirements are putting a challenge on us to keep those rates low. So that's, again, why we're starting to engage in these discussions with um, communities about what that, like actual you know, permitting of our infrastructure and what that process could look like as well. And um, on a really happy note, we have also, our team was talking about yesterday, we had a couple of big municipalities reach out to us proactively to discuss how we can work together to better streamline that that process as well too. So I'm not to say that it's a strained relationship everywhere, but I think a lot of us have this, um, the challenge of building new housing quickly on our minds. And uh, I guess Hydro has that same, uh, those same thoughts as our local government partners. We were monitoring, you know, all the communities that had the housing targets applied to them quite closely and also the recent announcements around uh, uh, housing around transit infrastructure and things like that too. Well, well, Nora has two questions related to that exact mm -hmm. topic. Um, one related to uh, existing multi-unit residential buildings, like the electrification of that. But then I think maybe even a more fundamental question, Nora, I, if you want to jump in here, but I'll just give you a little um, lead in or a, a little context. So I live in a multi residential um, co-housing community and we um, electrify set up level two charging for our every resident in the community and it was a big deal like we we had to really lean in and and navigate so many of the the technical legal um, components to that ourselves so I imagine and then and what we heard as we were doing this that there are very few other MERBs that were doing level two um, charging for vehicles. Um, so not just electrifying the buildings, but then even those buildings that are electric been providing sort of the, the vehicle charging infrastructure. So there's a couple of questions, Nora, that I'm wrapping into that. But if you wanna ask that question again, or, or pass it, we can pass it on to Robin as well as uh, Robin and maybe Jessica too. 
Yeah, no, just the, the two questions are a little bit sometimes interrelated. You know, I always ask people, well, why aren't, why don't you have an electric car yet? Or why don't you have a heat pump yet? And actually, m most people who are not uh, very knowledgeable say, uh, well, I'm not doing it because, you know, I'm really concerned that we're not going to have enough electricity in the future if everyone gets an electric car. So I'm not switching. Uh, anyway, and I, and I have no answer for that, although I have a better answer after hearing the you know report today. But having said that, I need just a one sentence answer for that question, because I, I, I basically run into that every day. And then secondly, we have a lot of existing multifamily buildings here, and they're going to be around for another 50 years. And so the question is, you know, going forward, we're, we're doing OK, but uh, here, but uh, we've we've got to deal with uh, retrofits and um, and electrifying those older buildings. So you know what's BC Hydro doing to to help? And I want to make sure we're on the on the program. Sure. Maybe I'll take a crack at them because um, I've heard that same question as well, Nora. So I mean, the first thing is that we're in surplus at the moment. We can actually are producing more electricity in BC than than we're than we're consuming. So we're in a great place. Uh, at the moment, and as as, Ro as, as Robin Webb said, um, you know, we've site C's coming on in two years. It's going to be adding another eight percent to our overall um, power uh, in BC. So we have some we have some breathing room, let's say, um, but we do absolutely need to be ramping up our electricity generation. That's why we've got our call for power out, um, and we need to absolutely be tracking trends. Like if we project to where we need to get to from a climate perspective, uh, that's a massive amount of electricity. Um, so we need to be uh, putting out calls for power and, 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 and generating that up. But we're not in a, in a bad situation at all here in BC. We've already got like 98% is clean. Um, so we've got confidence to be able to use that right now to decarbonize. Uh, we've got you know, a major uh, electricity coming on with Site C, and then we're planning for, for more generating more. So um, I absolutely understand people's anxiety around it. It requires us to be um, sort of grasping that opportunity that, and frankly, it's an economic development opportunity for us to be building clean electricity generation here in BC. We, you know, we, we have so much potential, um, but we actually need to be able to follow through on that um, and get that call for power out, uh, get that new, uh, that new electricity coming online um, once we've exhausted our, our, our current supplies. That's the, yeah, that's the Robin, first do you question. mind if I um, if I just add one? Yeah, more, please go on. Add, just add, one to, it, add to it. to it. Absolutely. Yeah. Upon joining Hydro, one of the most interesting things to me was hearing that our uh, load forecast had been flat for many years, and part of the reason for that was because of the efficiency, new efficiencies of equipment, in particular lighting. That um, as we switched from incandescent to compact fluorescence to LEDs, lighting demand just went down. So we were able to accommodate all of this population and economic growth without a whole bunch of new generation because of that. And, uh, you know, electrification will mean our demand is going to go up a lot, but we also see increasing efficiency of things like heat pumps, like a heat pump that someone installs 10 years from now, it's going to be more efficient than what we have today as well too so it's not um it's not necessarily just all of the the growth is happening without those gains in efficiency of all of the equipment that we work with and uh two members of our team that's all they do is look at trying to increase the efficiency standards for equipment in in canada as well too if i can uh jump in on the efficiency side of things too that's definitely where a lot of, of our work within Pembina is, is focused on what I was going to also um, raise. But I think as, as much as Robin's um, work spoke to the uh, incredible potential that we have um, for, for electricity opportunities and, and generation opportunities, there, there also is that incredible potential to reduce our load and not just in buildings and the, the new efficiencies of equipment, um, smart, uh, kind of grid and, and optimization opportunities like Robin Webb spoke to, um, making our buildings actually just 
more efficient overall in terms of our like the the envelope and structure of the building so it's using less um, but there's also like it's maybe not an easy answer to kind of give the general public Nora but around transportation I think for us as local government so putting on my, my other hat um, my intention and thought is not to just replace every gas vehicle with an electric vehicle and we're you know, it isn't about a one for one kind of switching of the amount of energy that we use as as a fossil fuel, we're just gonna switch that out for electricity. We have incredible potential to reduce kilometers driven, to reduce the amount of vehicles, to switch to transit, to switch to active transportation, to car share, mode share. And so there's also that decision making and, and how we advocate and support for less use of energy in our transportation system. And so, yes, the electricity will be there for those who need it for um, different modes of electric school buses and transit buses and, and our own um, local government equipment, you know, our, our own fleets and, and parks service vehicles and garbage trucks and all those things that maybe won't go away. We can electrify, but we have a really important rule or opportunity to, to play in reducing the amount of demand in, within our communities. Too. Mm -hmm. Well, um, so getting back to generation, Sue has a question related to the, uh, I'm assuming the IPPs and any other further hydro projects that might come online. Sue, do you want to yeah, ask? So, yeah, I saw that in, in the chat. Is is it the, the one in the chat you're referring to, Rick? Yeah, Sue, I'm yeah. not sure if you want to ask it or, or we'll just go off the chat. Let's let's do that, Robin. Yeah, for sure. So um, yeah, so there's the, for, for hydroelectric, of course, we have the large dams. Uh, and then we have the run of the river. Um, so the uh, site C is the, the last major site for, for um, large dam uh, that we have here in BC. Um, run of the river was a, a, the most cost effective in, uh, in the last call for power that was back in 2008 or so, so it's a long time ago, uh, but technologies have changed a lot. So we're anticipating, as I say, that, that wind and solar will probably be the, particularly wind will be the primarily um, applications coming into our call for power. Okay, John, uh, well, Sue, Sorry, some, Sue did so you wait, have a wait, John, hold on. Sue, you got to follow up. Thank you, thanks for that. And I'm often asked that question is kind of what's the future. And um, I, I'm just wondering too, around kind of the, the um, bioenergy piece and I uh, say as an example, where we have a locally a pulp mill who quite often helps us with our wildfire risk reduction work by using hog fuel, but they're, they're always on a quite a short time frame in terms of their contract to beat onto the grid. I'm just kind of wondering if those kinds of things will also be um, looked at more in terms of our ability to um, reduce the fire risk uh, and the way that yeah. we... Yeah. I was actually surprised about how much of our, um, we have 4% you know, of our electricity is currently through um, biomass. So we do actually have biomass systems as part of our electricity generation suit. Um, again, it'll be interesting to see if those applications come in in the next call for power. Um, but we absolutely work with uh, industry groups, oh, sorry, large scale industries uh, mm -hmm. around opportunities, both on the efficiency side and the generation side. I, I also, Rick, I wanted to, we didn't answer um, the question around multi-unit residential buildings mm. um, before we went on to John. So just didn't, didn't, didn't want to lose uh, that. Um, Webb, do you want to talk to that or do you want me to cover that? Yeah, I can I can talk about that because this is something I feel uh, very strongly about too, um, and I'm happy to to be able to say that um, currently hydro and uh, the province of BC and also the city of Vancouver are working on the design of some uh, incentive programs that are specifically oriented for multi-unit residential buildings, and during that process we're trying to take into account uh, the specific context of the different buildings that, um, you know, stratas that have a, a council of owners and also a management company sometimes have additional layers of decision making in order to get to the point of being able to say, okay, we're going to install like a heat pump for the entirety of our buildings. So looking at what some of those additional supports that might be needed for that sector, but also um, specifically programs that 
could target to market rental buildings as well too. And then um, Hydro in the province do currently have an incentive program for um, EV charging in multi-unit residential buildings where we'll help pay for um, studies and also the uh, infrastructure to make the entirety of the stalls in the building electric vehicle ready. And then individual owners can take advantage of the individual incentives for um, charging infrastructure. And I, I'll just note that program did, um, it was fully subscribed um, and actually went out of commission for a couple of months, but it is back in the market now as of a, a few weeks ago too, just in case anyone had, uh, hadn't heard about that. I'll go, um, I'll go find the link for it and stick it in the chat as well. Oh. Okay, and of course I can't resist but add a couple more things because obviously we're a tag team here with the same name. Um, so I mean, Nora, it is obviously you know dealing with a building stock there um, of existing buildings, and it is challenging, you know, retrofitting existing buildings as Rick found out. So it's absolutely critical we design them right in the first place. Uh, so kudos to all those local governments who've adopted EV ready uh, bylaws for new construction. Uh, we've you know, developed them as part of the EV peer network that Lisa was talking about, um, both for residential buildings and now commercial buildings, because it's so much easier to create that system when you design that building up front to have load sharing, to have a design, really be thoughtful around that uh, than trying to do it after the fact. So um, really encourage you if you don't have that adopted to look at that resource. And again, uh, Lisa Matt can probably head you that way. And then... Um, also, we're working with the province around the strata reports that you'd have to do annually to make sure that you're looking at what would electrification, what, what are the costs of electrification, uh, both on building, on the heating side, knowing we've got regs coming through on the provincial level around heating uh, and on the transportation side, uh, so that when you're doing overall depreciation reports for your, your building, planning long term for the building, you're also thinking about how do we uh, invest in in infrastructure that cr you know, creates the ability to electrify for for all of your um, your owners in there. Right. Thanks, Robin. So we've got John. I know you've got a second question. We've also we haven't heard from Steve yet. So, Steve, you've put your question in the Q and A. Do you want to go ahead and ask it? Yeah, sure. I'm just wondering if there's any uh, any thought towards using. Uh, using batteries on uh, vehicles to uh, level out the peaks. And I'm thinking uh, like, you know, as, as we further electrify things like school buses, uh, transit buses, that sort of thing, you're going to have extremely large batteries that should be able to level out peaks somewhat anyway. Yeah. Yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, that it's, when you start thinking about the batteries that we're going to be having in our lives, in our garages, in our buildings, um, I mean, we have very few power cuts. Uh, I'm, I'm in Vancouver, like I think I remember one, uh, one last year. Uh, it was during the daytime, and um, at the time, I thought I was actually fine because I had my battery on my computer. Uh, but if I actually had an electric vehicle, I, you know, I could have sort of plugged in there. So, uh, you know, what we can be doing personally, but also us as BC Hydro, like we've been talking um, with uh, school districts about if you had a bank of, um, of electric school buses, you know, can we use that uh, for, for, for dealing with those peaks? So you're absolutely around the right track, Steve. It's just super interesting once you start to think about uh, what that future grid looks like where we've got new technologies, we've got renewables, potentially solar on, on individual buildings, as well as these large scale utility uh, uh, projects that you know, Webb was describing. So it's gonna be different from what we've got today. Um, and that offers a, a bunch of opportunity for us to design right. Did I, did you have another question? Um, I don't know if I answered everything there. I got in a bit of a rant. No, that was... Steve, you got a follow up there because that that was the great answer, and it just comes back to that AMI 2.0, like the continuous upgrading of our smart grid, basically. Yeah. So That's right. uh, thank you. And we've got John, who's got a second question. John, go ahead. I'm just wondering. Um, we've got hydropower; it's a foundation for a long time. It's well, it's hydro. Um, but we also had a wide, very widespread drought in the province this year. 
And like I worry because like wildfires, I can see it possibly being something that's uh, more common and maybe larger. And I'm wondering how that's going to affect our generation of hydropower, if if it does at all. John, I don't you're, know. You're, yeah, you're absolutely right. We're we're living in a changing climate, and that's impacting all of us. Um, whether you're, um, you know, whether you're designing buildings around what future climate looks like, you know, the fact that we're starting to think that air conditioning is a, just a, a base requirement, uh, something that the, the province is, is, is bringing, like cooling requirements for new construction. Um, the, the amount of wild, wildfire that we're dealing with, how we protect our infrastructure in, in that circumstance, and then what's the impact of, of, of droughts. Um, so yes, we did experience a drought and it did impact our electricity generation this year. Um, so in our load forecast, we need to be thinking around, uh, you know, what will future um, electricity generation look like? And again, that's the opportunity to be able to balance off. You've got solar and, and wind and other such things. But we need to be thinking about future climate in our long term planning in the same way that I'm sure you are as local governments when you're thinking about floodplain elevation and and uh, et cetera, et cetera, sea level rise, et cetera. So yeah, we're, we're living in a different era and we need to be serious about it and get our heads around it. Thank you. Um, so we've got um, a few more minutes and, and I've got a couple questions for Jessica around RNG and, and we've been hearing about um, uh, from Fortis about their, their plans for, for future energy supplies related to, with a heavy emphasis on renewable natural gas. Um, Jessica, in your presentation, you talked about how there's probably going to be a role for RNG in certain sectors that are hard to electrify. My question is, what is the minimum um, infrastructure needed to support those um, uses? Um, and then does that sort of, by having a, a, a minimum need, what does that then do to, you know, the opportunities for tie-ins? I mean, if that infrastructure is there and you're delivering RNG, would you not then see opportunities for tying it into um, other uses like communities that are maybe farther or harder to reach that need more gas? Can you do it? Does that question make sense? And could you? Yeah, I, I think it makes sense. I don't know if I'm going to have uh, the, <laughs> the answer for you. Um, I don't know whether there's been a good analysis of maybe maybe Robin actually from the hydro side is they've got a, an understanding of sort of the future of electrification that way. Um, but I don't know if there's been a, a sort of a deep analysis of what um, the potential need will be for for fuels and energy in different um, applications where it, it is currently hard to to electrify i do know that um you know the a lot of the industrial processes uh the the proposed lng facilities for example but also some proposed large hydrogen facilities and and large uh, plants up more in the, in the northern part of the province are are wanting to connect to the grid and they want to electrify their their process and so that is also a, a demand that hydro um, is you know, having to, to face and, and plan for. They don't want to be burning fossil fuels for, for their industrial processes. Um, but there's going to be a, a phase, a period of time where we won't necessarily have uh, electricity available where we need it, but there will potentially be, you know, we're, we're getting, hearing more and more announcements about hydrogen and the availability of other um, fuels and and the use of renewable natural gas potentially, um, and, and you know, we also hear a lot in in the media, and there's been obviously a lot of federal government attention lately on, on heat pumps and and where they're sort of feasible and and not feasible, and, and a lot of I would say misinformation and miscommunication around cold weather applications for for different electricity opportunities. Um, but the reality is, is that there might be some parts of our country where if there's an existing natural gas system or, or fuel system um, and, and they can electrify and switch out to, to an electric system, having that other system as a backup in place and, and having the access to uh, 
a low carbon fuel to to meet those days when, when maybe electricity is not going to quite meet the demand. But um, I think we we don't necessarily have a, a great picture of what the full energy future is going to be out to 2040 and 2050. And that's also work that the province is, uh, is trying to do through a uh, climate aligned energy framework that they're working on and starting to look at you know, how do we do have an integrated energy plan where we understand um, how much electricity we're going to need, but also like, where do we taper off the other types of fuels uh, and and how do we integrate other other sources? And, you know, again, I go back to that um, image that, that Robin showed of the majority of our energy in BC is not from a clean source. We sort of think of our energy as being quite clean because we think of the electricity and how our electricity is, is so um, clean and historic. And we have this great resource, but that's actually a very small portion. So as we go through those transitions for you know, 2040, what does it look like? What does 2050 look like as we try to get move off of fuels? And there's some applications where fuel is the right type of, of energy source and electricity just won't meet that need because of you know, the, the type of um, molecule or, or energy that you need. But I don't think we have a very good understanding of that yet. Yeah. It's a it's a it's a challenging picture as a local governments. I think Nora spoke to this. We get these questions all the time from from skeptics, not about climate change, but skeptics ab about our ability to electrify at the scale we need. And I think the thing that hits me quite often is when I look at what is BC's share of energy and electricity, I think, represents anywhere from 18 to 20 percent of our total. And maybe that's optimistic of our total energy is is electric is only 18 percent. So 80 percent of that is 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 hydrocarbons um that pathway to 100 percent electrics seems really daunting and then and the and the answer is there's so much we don't know um and so coming up with a way to talk to our constituents who are trying to get on side and to encourage to make these um, decisions to go electric um we do need to do a better job of being able to answer those questions. And I think, I know we've got Ken Porter here and, and Robin, you've probably got something to say on this too, but in the few minutes we've got, Ken, if you're available, um, maybe a last word on this from you. If not, then maybe Robin, you know, that that question, that fundamental question we get as we try to uh, go 100% electric in our communities and then the resistance we get both from some of our residents who kind of know what they're talking about, as well as from just the in, the challenges of going full electric. Um, it, yeah, so Ken's not there, then maybe Robin, a last word to you on that before we wrap up. Yeah, um, I, I think, I don't know that we're gonna get 100% electric. Uh, I think there's there are fuels that are out there, um, but I think we're talking out like 2040, 2050, and I think we can get stuck in the, you know, what does that look like in those times? Uh, we absolutely need, we understand that, yes, we can, uh, that in a 2030, like, let's think about that, that time frame at the moment, we absolutely need to crank up the trajectory. Uh, we need to get off fossil fuels wherever we can, in, in cars, in, in, um, uh, you know, in, in buildings, etc. I completely support the comments people were saying there around efficiency and, you know, get out of cars and get onto buses, etc. What that overall energy pie looks like um, in 2040, 2050, I don't know. Um, there'll be a bunch of new technologies. There'll be a bunch of fuel, new, new fuels. Um, but certainly the easiest fuel that's available right now um, to decarbonize um, is electricity. So uh, tr you know, tr trying as, as much as we can uh, to be able to push that, I think, is a, is a, a good strategy from a climate perspective. Yeah. We've, Caroline, I'm going to. Yeah, some great qu comments there on the. Oh, there's yeah. a question there about the climate, uh, climate aligned energy framework. Uh, I don't know if you want to talk to that, Jessica. And, and I'm noticing we got Ken there too, just popped in. And we're going to be oh, wrapping up soon, Ken. Thank so, <laughs> Caroline, I'm going to maybe we'll give Ken a chance to say something and then back to you to wrap us up. Oh, Ken, I think you're muted.
Nope, still can't hear you. <laughs> He's trying to that's get sweet. speaking through his moustache, that's the problem. <laughs> that's right. It is Movember. Movember's hitting hard. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, no luck, Ken. Yeah, okay. Well, Dude. that's too bad. Um, so Sue just dropped in a few good questions there right at the end. Um, no worries, uh, I can I can follow up after the others yeah. might be interested too. Not sure. So. Okay. Well, Ken, we'll have to get you back and 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 cast maybe a few of you guys back at, at the next one to to speak from uh, the province's perspective, Caroline. Ken, just plug something else in. Did that work, Ken? Nope. <laughs> Shoot. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we will. We will hear from. We'll hear from Climate Action Secretariat in the future and the Ministry of of Environment and potentially the Ministry of Energy as well. If we're planning some future, uh, future exciting webinars. Um, I think Carly's going to quickly um, share the Mentimeter. If you still have Mentimeter open, um, she can share that link again. Just if you would like to post uh, in the Mentimeter. Uh, topics you'd like to hear for future webinars, meetings, speakers, um, anything of that nature, you can post it in the Mentimeter. Yeah. So what would you like to know more about as we plan for our BC Municipal Climate Leadership Council in 2024? And that's the Greater Climate Leaders Program. Um, post it in the Mentimeter. And oh, we're losing Jessica. Thanks so much, Jessica, for coming on. Um, and so just take a moment and post for us there, if you would, what anything you'd like to, anything you'd like to see in the future. And that would be great. And we also, the Community Energy Association has a monthly e-newsletter. So uh, you can stay in the loop on CEA projects and events that help to accelerate local climate action. You may unsubscribe at any time and your information will not be sold to third parties. So you can contact us. Uh, I think Carly's going to put the link in the chat for that. And um, we also, through the Climate Leaders Program, we also support uh, elected officials on in a coaching program, which is uh, run by Andrea Reimer, who is a former Vancouver City Councilor and a former BC MCLC alumni, and now a, a strategic advisor to, to us and to elected officials. So we do have a few spots left in our Climate Leaders Coaching Program, which begins in two weeks, I believe, the first session. And there is more information. I think, again, Carly can has probably already posted it in the chat, the link to the bcclimateleaders.ca coaching program. So yeah, please uh, absolutely feel free to contact us at any time if you have any questions, uh, would like certain content, uh, if there's any way that any of us can support you, this is what we are here for. So with that, I the we're going to monitor the Mentimeter and <laughs> thank you so much for for you for coming today and uh, we will be sharing the link to the to the webinar so you can share it with your colleagues if they were unable to attend but thank you so much for the great questions and the great presentations today very much appreciated and I hope you have a great day thank you so much